Good afternoon. My name is Alan Brown. I'm the Continuing Edu Education Specialist with the UNC Cancer Network. I would like to thank you for joining us today um, for our Community Lunch and Learn lecture titled Coping with Chemo Brain. If you have any problems during the lecture um, where you need support, uh, feel free to email us at uncn at unc.edu or text or call the number 919-445-1000. We'll also be using Poll Everywhere today, which is a software that allows you to interact with us and the presenter um, during the lecture via text message. Um, in just a minute, I'll post a poll on the screen that will allow you to begin using that program. But in order to do that, you will need a, a mobile phone um, that will allow you to send text messages. And to enroll into the room to participate in Poll Everywhere, you will need to send a text message, the letters UNCCN, to the number 22333. And this is the poll that we're going to start with today, kind of as an icebreaker for our lecture. Um, in the past, medical professionals thought chemo brain was pure, purely a psychological phenomenon. However, recent research has provided objective evidence that chemotherapy and other factors during and after cancer treatment can cause changes in brain structure and function. So, true or false? To participate in this poll, again, text the letters UNCCN to the number 22333. And then once you've done that, you will receive a confirmation that you're participating in the polls for today. And then you will respond with the letter A for true and B for false. We will also use this software at the end of our lecture um, to allow for interactive question and answer uh, with our presenter. In just a few minutes, we'll revisit this poll um, to take a look at any <coughs> submitted results. Um, our presenter today is Dr. Carla Thompson. Um, she is a clinical neuropsychologist with the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation at UNC Chapel Hill. She has a joint, joint appointments with departments of psychiatry and neurology. Dr. Thompson works closely with patients and the families of patients with many different kinds of medical conditions that can affect brain function. Many of the patients she sees have experienced changes in their thinking, memory, or other aspects of their cognitive, physical, and or emotional functioning as a result of injury or illness. Her clinical work focuses on helping people understand not just how their brains may have changed, but what they can do to feel better and function better. Um, so Dr. Thompson, thank you so much for being with us here today. Glad um, to be here. We appreciate you taking your time to share information um, with us on uh, this topic, which I'm sure will be very interesting. Um, so taking a look at our results so far, um, we can see that we're kind of trending in the direction that most people agree um, with the sta statement about chemo brain. Um, so would you like to speak a little bit about that? Or I'm, I'm curious, can you tell how many people have responded? Um, not. I can look quickly. 100% of however many people have responded. Okay. Um, I do think that for many years it was a, a common perception that what we've ended up calling chemo brain, changes in attention, concentration, memory, associated with cancer and cancer treatment, was assumed to be a consequence of lots of other things that are part of a cancer diagnosis and treatment, as opposed to a direct consequence of chemotherapy per se. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that during the course of the presentation. Okay. All right. Well, to answer your question, we've had about five people. This okay. Morning, so good right. participation so far. Well, without any further ado, I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. Thompson. Thank you. Um, and feel free to get started and take it away. All right. Hopefully, my uh, I'll be able to manage the technology. Um, I am very grateful to have the opportunity to speak with you today about this topic. Um, Certainly working with cancer survivors is a part of what I do professionally. I also have a personal interest in this topic. I have a strong family history of reproductive cancer. Um, I had cervical cancer when I was in my early 30s. My mother and my sister are breast cancer survivors, both doing well. Um, but this is a topic that's very near and dear to my heart. And I'm hoping that there will be time for us to have um, some, some conversation about this issue at the end of the presentation. All right, I'm going to be using the words cognition and cognitive a great deal during the course of the next 45 minutes, so I think it makes sense for me to explain what I'm talking about. 
Cognition refers to the mental processes involved in understanding, thinking, and remembering. And some examples are the, the ability to understand what we see and hear, the ability to focus our attention and keep paying attention over time, the ability to learn and remember new information, and the ability to use information to reason or problem solve. As we talk about chemo brain and then what we can do to manage the effects of chemo brain, I'm going to be referencing two major bodies of literature. Um, part of what I'm going to be talking about comes from research on rehabilitation for after brain injury. So what we've learned over the years about what can help people recover from traumatic brain injuries, strokes, or specifically the effects of chemotherapy. I'm also going to be drawing on the literature that um, informs what we know about things that can help protect against cognitive decline as we age. So things that are, are uh, modifiable risk factors for dementia. Well, it's widely accepted at this point. Everyone recognizes that changes in cognitive function are really common in cancer survivors. And this is, of course, not surprising in people who have brain cancer. That would be expected. But we also see concerns about changes in thinking and memory and other cognitive abilities in folks with lots of different kinds of cancer. Lots of research on breast cancer survivors, but also complaints of cognitive dysfunction in people with prostate cancer, lung cancer, leukemia, and lymphoma. Um, we certainly see concerns about changes in cognition in patients who are treated with chemotherapy, but I think it's also important to acknowledge that we see this in people with cancer who are not treated with chemotherapy as well. So at least part of what people are experiencing and reporting is probably a function of the cancer itself and other treatments that are used, um, not just chemotherapy. That being said, we know that patients with cancers that have been treated with chemotherapy are three to five times more likely to report cognitive symptoms than those who are not. So what is chemo brain? What kinds of complaints are common? Um, we don't typically see changes in very basic cognitive abilities, like the ability to understand and use language or to interpret visual and spatial information. Um, very commonly reported symptoms, though, are changes in attention. So people will talk about trouble concentrating, uh, being more vulnerable to distraction, and in particular, trouble multitasking. When people attempt to divide their attention between different tasks, often they, they struggle with that. People also talk about changes in what we call processing speed, just how quickly um, they're able to make sense of things. People describe feeling like their thinking is slower or more effortful, and it takes them longer to get things done, even if they can't identify any specific reason that that's the case. Somehow everything just ends up taking longer than it used to or they think it's supposed to. And then memory. And there are lots of different ways that memory can break down. Common complaints have to do with forgetting words or names. You recognize common objects, but you, it's a tip of the tongue phenomenon. You can't remember what something's called. Um, and it's not that you've forgotten what the object is. It's just that accessing that label has become a little more difficult. People also sometimes talk about forgetting details from conversations. I would not expect somebody who had a cancer treated with chemotherapy to forget who they were or where they grew up or any important details of their personal history. But typically what's compromised is the ease with which you learn and retain new information. So a lot of these changes um, in cognitive function are attributed to chemotherapy, but it is important to acknowledge that there are a lot of other factors we know also can compromise cognitive efficiency. Um, the cancer itself. As I mentioned earlier, folks with cancers that were not treated with chemotherapy still experience some changes in their cognitive functioning. Um, we know that some of the medications used as part of cancer treatment, not just the chemotherapy agents, but other medications, can also have cognitive side effects. Surgery and the drugs used dur during surgery can have an impact on how your brain functions. If there's any history of infection, uh, we know that inflammation also tends to take the edge off your cognitive functioning. And then common problems with sleep and or cancer-related fatigue are also going to interfere with how well your brain works. And we're going to revisit these issues probably throughout the next 40 minutes. Other factors that we also know contribute to cognitive impairment during and after cancer include nutritional deficiencies. Um, if your appetite is off and you're not eating as well as you used to or you can't tolerate certain foods, 
Um, or if your diet just isn't balanced, that has the potential to contribute to or exacerbate um, some problems with attention or memory. Pain certainly compromises cognitive functioning. Um, pain is distracting. No matter how well you think you're dealing with it, it often demands some attentional resources, which means you have less left over to use in dealing with day-to-day -day demands. And then changes in hormones. Um, most of us have direct experience of the fact that um, hormonal factors can influence not just our thinking, but our mood as well. Um, and there are very commonly changes in hormone functioning with cancer and cancer treatment. Um, so these are things that we recognize are important, we can't necessarily do anything about, but need to acknowledge. And then the emotional response to having can a cancer diagnosis and associated concerns can also contribute to your brain not working as well as it typically does. Anxiety, depression, stress, and what they're now calling cancer distress are all going to have the potential to interfere with your attention, your thinking, and your memory. <coughs> so um, medical professionals did used to have a, a kind of bias that chemo brain was either a purely psychological phenomenon or was due entirely to those other factors that I just talked about. Um, and this was due partly to the fact that reported symptoms are often much more dramatic than deficits identified by objective testing. So a, a patient may come in and say, oh my gosh, I can't remember anything, my multitasking is horrible, and still perform well on a mini mental status exam or more extensive cognitive testing. And for a long time, the medical com community took that as evidence that what the patients were reporting wasn't real. Um, we know better now. We know that how you measure things makes a big difference in terms of what you pick up on. Um, but this was, I think, part of the problem for a long time. Um, However, more recent research has definitely provided objective evidence that um, there are changes in both brain structure and brain function um, associated with treatment with chemotherapy. And that's even after controlling for the effects of all those other factors that I mentioned earlier. So this graph um, just gives you a, 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 some sense of how publications about chemo brain, medical publications about chemo brain, have increased in number over the last 15 years. Um, and the blue bar on the left is 2000, I guess we're part way into the next year. I would expect that six months from now that blue bar will be as high as the orange bar. There's definitely been an increase in publications that address this specific topic. Um, this doesn't mean, though, that medicine has completely ignored cognitive changes associated with cancer and chemotherapy. This slide shows you um, publications that I identified by searching for the words cancer and cognitive impairment. And this includes publications that go all the way back to 1975. You see the same trend in that there, there uh, are increasing numbers every year. Um, but this just helps illustrate that part of what has changed is the label that we're using for symptoms that I think have been present for quite a while. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the different theories about how chemo brain happens or why chemotherapy can influence cognitive functioning. Um, many of the agents used for chemotherapy are not supposed to cross the blood-brain barrier. The blood-brain barrier refers to the fact that the, um, the blood vessels in our brain are, are supposed to be they're set up so that certain important things are allowed to pass through the walls of the blood vessels, but many neurotoxins are not supposed to. It's a selectively permeable membrane. Um, one of the things that research has informed us of over time, though, is that chemotherapy can affect how permeable that blood-brain barrier is. So while there may be things that typically in a normal healthy person would not um, cross that barrier into the brain tissue, that may change as a function of chemotherapy. We also know that chemotherapy often is associated with increased inflammation in the central nervous system. And inflammation is um, implicated in a lot of neurologic diseases and processes. Chronic inflammation is thought to be a risk factor for Alzheimer's disease. It's something that we see in multiple sclerosis. So anything that increases the potential for inflammation in the central nervous system also has the potential to compromise brain function. Chemotherapy is also toxic to the neural progenitor cells that form neurons and other brain cells. You've probably heard of, brain, uh, of, of stem cells. Um, progenitor cells are stem cells that are already a little more 
well-developed and on their way to becoming functional neurons. Um, they are the building blocks for something called neuroplasticity. Um, every time you learn something new, every time you have an experience that affects um, your awareness or your understanding of the world, there are actually changes that occur on a neuronal level in your brain. And that plasticity is part of what helps us recover from injury or insult. Um, after a traumatic brain injury, there are cells that are damaged or compromised. Neuroplasticity is one of the mechanisms by which, pe by which people recover function over time. And we understand now that chemotherapy is probably compromising that process. <clears throat> chemotherapy is also associated with reduced activation of specific brain regions during cognitive tasks. Um, it's overly simplistic to think that different parts of your brain do specific and only specific things. Um, but we do know that different brain regions are associated with different kinds of functions. Um, and with certain kinds of brain imaging, we can actually see which parts of the brain are more active or less active during specific tasks. Um, <clears throat> what we have seen in some folks who have had cancer treated with chemotherapy is that the parts of their brain that normally are active in performing tasks that involve attention or verbal fluency or memory are underactive or less active than they are typically in somebody who has not been treated with chemotherapy. They may perform reasonably well on those tasks, but often doing so requires that they recruit other parts of their brain to participate in completing the task, or their brains just have to work harder in order to perform at a comparable level. We know that chemotherapy affects the levels of transmitters, that, uh, neurotransmitters in the brain that are involved in mood and sleep and cognition. Neurotransmitters are those chemical messengers that help the, the neurons in your brain communicate with one another and different regions of the brain communicate with one another. We talked a little bit earlier already about hormones, testosterone and estrogen, both play roles in cognitive, cognitive performance. So when there are treatments that, that affect those levels, you expect to see changes in cognition. As a general overall rule, um, people sometimes talk about the effects of chemotherapy on the brain as being as causing accelerated brain aging um, and increasing the risk for dementia. Um, our brains change with normal aging. That's just that's part of the, the way things work. Um, but there's some thought that chemotherapy, as well as other kinds of experiences, can kind of accelerate that normal process so that I, at 54, if I've been treated with chemotherapy, may have a brain that functions more like it would if I were 65. I want to talk a little bit about um, gray matter and white matter changes, uh, because much of the research on chemo brain um, has focused on changes in gray matter and white matter. And some of the treatments that we know are effective in improving cognitive function also are based on studies that have looked at gray matter and white matter. Most of you are probably familiar with these terms to some extent. Gray matter refers to um, the cell bodies in your brain as well as the kind of the tips of the cell bodies where the cell bodies talk to one another. The white matter is made up of mostly something called myelin. It's like an insulation. Um, it helps, helps the, the neurons communicate with one another by facilitating electrical, neuro, uh, electrochemical impulses transmitted from one cell to another. Um, and you can see on the slide, hopefully, that you've got gray matter, the cell bodies, and a lot of white matter, which is all the connections between them. A lot of the research on chemotherapy has been done in breast cancer survivors. Um, and there have been studies that show that breast cancer survivors may show decreased white matter integrity and decreased gray matter volume um, in particular parts of the brain um, after chemotherapy. The hippocampus is, the hippocampi, because you've got two, are structures in the brain that uh, play a central role in storing memory. Um, the prefrontal cortex plays a central role in attention um, and related functions. Um, and there have been studies that suggest that breast cancer survivors treated with chemotherapy are going to show kind of a, a degradation in white matter and some potential volume loss in the gray matter of their brains as well. Follow-up studies suggest that for some people, these changes persist um, for decades after treatment, while in other cases, there's evidence of, of resolution or improvement. 
Um, there have been similar studies that have looked at white matter and gray matter changes in folks who have other kinds of cancer. So people with leukemia who've been treated with chemo sh sh may show some volume loss and associated cognitive dysfunction. Chemo is associated with alterations in brain metabolism of patients with pharyngeal cancer. And individuals with prostate cancer often show reduced brain activity and connectivity, as indicated by the, those white matter tracks. So the take-home message here is that chemotherapy causes, or is at least associated with measurable changes in brain structure and function, um, that may reasonably assume to contribute to those cognitive symptoms that we've ended up calling chemo brain. All right, so what determines outcomes? Not everybody gets chemo brain. <clears throat> Not everybody who experiences symptoms of cognitive dysfunction um, has those symptoms persist over time. We know that every cancer is different. Um, even if you have two people who have been diagnosed with exactly the same cancer, they're different people. And the manifestations of their cancer may be different. Um, the effects on their brain and body may be different. So there's tremendous variability. Um, and then every treatment regimen is different. Even, again, if you're in a clinical trial where everybody is, in theory, getting exactly the same chemotherapy regimen, um, there's the potential for that, that treatment to interact differently with the individual body. Um, so there's individual variability. Every patient who has cancer has a brain that's going to be different from somebody else's. Um, people have cognitive strengths and weaknesses. Some people are really good with language. Some people are really good with visual spatial abilities. Some people have attention deficit disorder that was present and, and readily identifiable before they were ever diagnosed with cancer. These are all things that we expect to influence how people respond to cancer and chemotherapy. Um, having a history of other medical problems and or psychiatric challenges is also expected to make a difference in how you respond to cancer and cancer treatment and potentially help predict how well you're going to do if you do end up with something that we would call chemo brain. There may also be some genetic vulnerabilities that determine whether folks are more likely to experience cognitive dysfunction with chemotherapy. Um, that research is still mostly in its infancy, though. Um, I think it's also important to keep in mind that the impact of chemo brain may depend at least somewhat on the demands that are placed on the individual um, who's been treated for cancer. Um, people for whom their, their sense of self um, or their work is heavily dependent on them being quick and sharp and having a great memory um, may feel or functionally be more disabled by chemo brain than people for whom um, that, that you know, sharp thinking or good memory is less an important part of their self-concept or their work or their roles in other settings. So in thinking about outcomes, we're going to revisit those other factors that I talked about earlier. <clears throat> if you um, have identified that you're having problems with your thinking or memory or other changes in your cognition that you associate with your cancer diagnosis or treatment, um, it's important to make sure that these other factors are not actually making things worse for you. Um, depression, it, it can be hard, I think, and my next slide talks about this. It can be a little difficult to distinguish between depression and what are probably normal, appropriate, um, negative emotional responses to having cancer. Um, but we know that issues with mood and issues with anxiety complicate recovery from brain injury, brain injury of any kind. Um, so that if you're able to identify that these are issues for you, it's important to attempt to address them in some way. Um, stress, we all talk about stress, we all have different ideas about what stress actually is, but the reality is that if you are stressed out by something in your environment or in your life or even your own concerns, that has a direct impact on your physiological functioning. Um, and has the potential to complicate your recovery from chemo brain. Um, so active stress management strategies are one of the things that we recommend for facilitating recovery if you've had changes in your cognitive function with chemotherapy. Sleep problems and fatigue. Again, <clears throat> fatigue is a very common side effect of cancer and cancer treatment. Um, even prior to a cancer diagnosis, we've all had the experience of 
being super, super tired, you know, sleep deprived or just exhausted for other reasons, and noticing that we have more trouble um, during those times with things like word finding or ke keeping our attention on a task or remembering stuff we know we know but can't pull up on demand. Um, and there's been a lot of research that suggests that sleep problems are a risk factor for cognitive impairment, both in the short term and the long term, and we're going to talk about all those. Hormonal changes again, and then other medical comorbidities. Comorbidity is just a fancy word for other medical problems that you might have. Okay, if you have cancer, but you also have diabetes and hypertension, um, which are risk factors in and of themselves for cognitive impairment, you may be more likely to have chemo brain, or you may be more likely to have troubles kind of getting past that or getting better. Um, so making sure that you, you're seeing your primary care doctor and not just your oncologist and trying to manage general health conditions as well as issues related to your cancer is really important. Um, I want to talk a little bit about recovery over time. Um, certainly not everyone who's treated with chemotherapy gets chemo brain. Um, my mother who was treated for breast cancer 20 years ago with pretty aggressive chemotherapy didn't have any cognitive problems that we could identify at the time. My sister who was treated more recently definitely had some changes in her thinking and her memory, um, but she also developed diabetes and had a concussion during the course of treatment. So it's hard to tease those things apart. Um, but certainly there are people who appear to tolerate chemotherapy well and don't report any significant changes in their cognitive function. But then there are many people who notice pretty significant changes, and not necessarily during the course of treatment itself, um, but potentially weeks or even months after they've completed chemotherapy, um, and they're a point in, at a point in their recovery where they're ready to return to work or return to school and begin to recognize that they're not functioning as well as they used to. Many people who do experience cognitive deficits, what we're calling chemobrain, um, get better over time. So they have a period of weeks or months where they're not as sharp as they were, or they don't function as well as they used to, but gradually over time get better to the point where they feel like they've returned to their baseline. Um, there are occasionally other folks, though, who show persistent def deficits that go on for a long time to the extent that they're characterized as being permanent. We don't know yet what the consistent risk factors are for no improvement or even cognitive decline over time for people that have been treated with chemotherapy. That's research that um, is going to take additional time, and hopefully 10 or 20 years from now we'll have a much better sense of what those factors might be, but at this point, we don't really know. I have one slide that talks about prevention. Um, just going back and looking at the more recent literature, I found two studies, um, both in animal models, that investigated the potential utility of some, one is a, a plant flavonoid, another is a, a some kind of chemical. But in, in animal models, when um, used in conjunction with commonly used chemotherapy agents, appeared to be somewhat protective. Okay, so the, the rats who got chemotherapy plus these other agents showed less cognitive impairment and or better recovery over time than the rats who didn't. I'm not familiar with any human studies yet. If any of you are, um, during the Q&A, hopefully you can let me know. But I think that this is still rel a relatively new focus of the research. I will say that um, you know, all the ongoing research looking at identifying the most effective chemotherapy agents for different kinds of cancer, um, all of those studies now include ongoing assessment and monitoring of the cognitive side effects of those treatments. Um, and the goal is always to maximize the therapeutic effects of a chemotherapy regimen. You know, the, nuke the cancer as much as you can without also causing side effects that are significantly problematic for survivors. So that's, that's part of the science now, trying to balance those two things. All right, now this is the part that really matters, right? It's like, what, what can help um, if you have experienced changes in your cognitive functioning with chemotherapy? What can help you feel or function better? Um, and again, you know, reference to those other, other factors that I talked about earlier. Um, if there are problems with your sleep, they can be treated, they can be addressed. Um, we know that, again, in normal, healthy people, poor sleep 
decreases cognitive efficiency and makes psychiatric symptoms worse. If you take a normal healthy person and you deprive them completely of sleep for a couple days, they may become psychotic. Um, we also know that untreated sleep disorders like sleep apnea cause significant cognitive impairment. Um, so if your sleep quality is poor or your sleep quantity is poor, this is something that ideally you would talk about with your doctors. Sleep quality can be improved using something we call good sleep hygiene. It's a kind of funky phrase, but it basically refers to things you can do that are, are going to increase the likelihood that you'll fall asleep and stay asleep and feel rested when you wake. So things like keeping your bedroom cool and dark, um, avoiding screen time for up to an hour before bedtime. Um, and most of us older adults may be comfortable with that, but if you're talking to a younger adult or a teenager, that's a concept that's really difficult for them to embrace. Um, getting up and out of bed if you're awake for 10 or 15 minutes and you know you're just not going to fall asleep so that your bed doesn't become associated with not being able to sleep. Um, using your bed mostly just for sleeping and sex as opposed to other activities because again you want bed to be associated with sleep. We know that regular physical activity improves sleep quality is also, and is also associated, associated with improved cognition. Um, there are medications that certainly can help with sleep problems, but be sure you talk about this with your doctor. Um, don't just go to the drugstore and get an over-the-counter sleep aid. And, and it may be something that helps you fall asleep and stay asleep, but many of those agents have potential cognitive side effects themselves. Um, so it's, it's, it's a good thing to discuss with your doctor. If your doctor makes a recommendation about something that you can take over the counter, that's fine. Um, but I would get a physician's input. Um, I talked a little bit about depression earlier. We know that depression causes slow thinking, decreased concentration, and increased forgetfulness, even in people who are otherwise healthy. Um, it can be difficult to know whether you're depressed or just sad, discouraged, or grieving. Um, and men in particular sometimes have a hard time telling the difference. Um, but if you feel sad, empty, irritable, or emotionally numb most of the day, more days than not for days at a time, it probably makes sense to talk about that with your doctor as well. Okay. There are many effective treatments for depression. Individual counseling works just as well as medication. Sometimes couples counseling is appropriate or group therapy. Um, the most effective treatments are often a combination of counseling and medication. Um, but again, something to discuss with your doctor. And again, we know that changes in both diet and exercise can actually improve mood as effectively as many medications. Most people with cancer are going to worry. It kind of comes with the territory. You may worry about your own health, your ability to work, your ability to care for your family. You may worry about money, or you may be worrying about your brain not working like it used to. Um, and to some extent, all of these things, it makes sense for you to be thinking about them. Um, but we know that anxiety increases distractibility and interferes with memory. And if your worry is so intense and overwhelming that it interferes with your ability to function properly, um, it probably ought to be treated. And the treatment options are similar to those that are available for depression. I do think it's important to keep in mind that some medications that are sometimes used to treat acute anxiety also take the edge off your thinking um, and are, are typically not an ideal long-term solution. So things like Valium or Xanax that may calm you down physiologically in the moment are not necessarily going to make you think and function better long-term. So what else can help? Let's talk a little bit about cognitive training and retraining and something called mind-body skills. So um, I'll ask for a show of hands, even though I can't hear you. How many of you have heard of Lumosity or other brain training programs that are commercially available? I see two hands. Oh, more than two. Okay. All right. If you listen to NPR, you probably hear Lumosity um, ads fairly frequently. Uh, within the last several years, there's been this proliferation of web-based or um, computer-based brain training programs. Um, and they are widely available. Um, Lumosity got in trouble recently for um, advertising benefits that they couldn't necessarily support with research. 
but they're basically all they're brain games. They're they're things that are designed to improve your attention or the or your reaction time or your memory. Um, there's not a lot of research to support their effectiveness in terms of improving general cognitive functioning over time. Um, there have been a couple studies that suggest they may generalize to other settings, but there's no guarantee that just because you've improved your score on a brain game that that's going to make you function more effectively in the real world. Um, I still often recommend them to patients because patients will often say they feel like their thinking is sharper or they feel more awake and alert when they use these tools on a regular basis. Another alternative for facilitating recovery from brain injury is something called cognitive rehabilitation. We do this a lot um, in physical medicine and rehab, which is my, my, my primary home, with people who've had strokes or traumatic brain injuries or brain tumors or other obvious insults to their brain function. Occupational therapists or speech language pathologists often work one on one with patients to provide them with some instruction in organizational or compensatory strategies to minimize the impact of their cognitive weaknesses on their day to day functioning and also to kind of teach them some tricks for functioning better. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about what some of those are. Um, OT and PT. You, you need a doctor's order for these therapies, but insurance will also often cover them. And I work with a speech language pathologist that works with folks with chemo brain all the time, and insurance seems to be willing to cover that service. All right, so some examples of those organizational and compensatory strategies, which are things that we could all benefit from using. Um, there's something called the Ohio Principle, which stands for only handle it once. This is one of my favorites, partly because I can remember it and remember what it means. Um, it's what it sounds like for email or regular mail or other tasks. If you can start the task and end the task and not have to remember to go back to it later, that's great. That's wonderful. Um, one of the places that our memories tend to fail us more often than not is when we start something and we think, okay, I'm going to come back to this later and finish it or take care of it. Um, Often, often we forget to go back and finish. Um, so this is a, a way of kind of improving cognitive efficiency. It's great for regular mail. You get the mail from the mailbox, you go through it, you throw out what you don't need, you pill, pay the bills that you need to, and you're done. Um, <clears throat> having um, increased organization in your physical environment is also really helpful. So have a place for everything. Some people do this naturally. Some people do not. I'm one of those people who does not do it naturally. I had to learn to do this. So a hook next to the door for my memory stick and my keys, a specific drawer where I put my bills and my checkbook and other important papers. Um, the utility of this is in that if you bring that increased structure to your environment, you don't have to remember where you put things. You will know where they are because they're where they're supposed to be. Other things like just repetition um, for acquiring new information, something called multimodal learning, which is when you um, try to acquire information through more than one sense, sense. So you read something, but then read it out loud so you also hear it. That tends to facilitate recall. And using external memory aids like calendars or apps on your computer, alarms on the phone, all the things that uh, when we're young and proud and healthy, we don't necessarily, did, didn't have to use. Um, and sometimes are reluctant to consider the possibility that maybe they would be beneficial now. Um, but they really are time-saving tools and energy-saving tools. Um, make use of those tools that are available to you so that you have more left over uh, to use in focusing on things that are personally relevant for you. And the last thing I'm going to talk about on this slide is a phrase, the word metacognition, which just refers to our understanding and awareness of our own thought processes. Thinking about how you think, learning about how you learn and remember. Cognitive training programs, cognitive rehabilitation programs are both useful in improving metacognition. Because if you recognize where things are likely to break down for you, you can come up with strategies for working around that. Um, I know that if somebody pokes their head in my office and says something to me, I'm probably not going to remember it later. Um, if they write it down and put it in front of me, on a post-it note, I'm much more likely to remember it later. I've also gotten in the habit of requesting reminders from my support staff. So 
All right. Mind-body skills are skills which, with regular practice, can reduce emotional and physical reactivity and improve this thing we call resilience. So they improve our, our response to stressors and our ability to kind of bounce back when stressed. Um, and there are a whole slew of things that are referred to as mind-body skills. Many of them are taught in cancer support programs, like the Get Real and Heal program here at UNC. Medical communities are also starting to teach them to doctors and nurses and other health professionals to use in reducing stress and burnout. There's been a lot of research that suggests these same kinds of skills are also effective in improving both emotional adjustment and cognitive functioning. So some examples are different forms of meditation, guided imagery, uh, what they call breath work, which is a focused um, breathing exercises where your attention is focused on your breath, yoga and other movement therapies, certain kinds of journal writing, certain kinds of drawing, things like self-hypnosis and biofeedback, all fall with under the general um, heading of mind-body skills. Um, as part of that, too, regular physical activity of any kind would go, dance is lovely, yoga is wonderful, but anything that gets your heart pumping on a regular basis is going to promote neurogenesis, that migration of undifferentiated stem cells to become functional neurons in your brain. Lots of research to support this idea. It's not just, you know, it's a real thing. Uh, we know that exercise helps prevent cognitive decline and it improves recovery after brain injury. Um, any other activities that require mental focus and kind of active engagement are also likely to be good for your brain. Um, active journaling is one mind-body skill that's been identified as useful for cancer survivors. Um, and it's basically what it sounds like, just thinking about what the issues are that are most important to you at this point in time, writing about them as a form of expression, um, and get, thinking about them in a purposeful way. So I first heard about this thing called forest bathing maybe two years ago when I was reading a book on recovery, improving cognitive function after chemotherapy. Um, and it sounded like a lovely idea. It's like, oh, you go out and spend time in nature and, and your brain gets better. Um, but the Japanese have actually been doing a whole lot of research on this. Um, and I don't expect you to be able to read this slide, um, but I threw it up there so that, you know, there are actually publications where they're looking at um, concentrated exposure to nature as an intervention that actually has the potential to be protective um, when it comes to cancer and um, has the potential to improve brain function after cancer with chemotherapy. It's typically not just a walk in the woods, but a, a kind of immersion experience where you're encouraged to use all of your senses um, your, your sight, your sense of smell, taste even, um, to, to, as I said, immerse yourself in the experience. But there are good data to suggest this is actually therapeutic, not just in terms of stress management, but there are physiological benefits as well. And I'm watching the clock. Um, another thing that um, may sound kind of woo-woo to you if you're not familiar with it, but actually has a lot of research to support its utility, is something called mindfulness meditation. Mindfulness meditation is a, a form of meditation that has, a, has its roots in Buddhist meditation practices, but it's not a religious or spiritual practice at all. It's basically a way to train your brain to shut up and be still, or to slow down and pay attention more effectively. Um, it involves lots of exercises and focused and sustained attention um, and awareness of what it is that you're attending to. It's a skill, like any other skill, you need to practice in order to get good at. I can tell you that the more difficult it is for you initially, the greater the potential utility there is. I like to say I have an active but undisciplined mind, um, and there's certain, sometimes it's pleasant to follow your thoughts wherever they go, um, but that's not necessarily what you need to do in every situation. Um, there's good data to suggest that with regular practice, um, and it may be five or ten minutes a day, there are some pretty significant, significant benefits to mindfulness meditation, both in terms of increased attention, increased memory, um, decreased reactivity to stress, but also some other physical benefits like decreased blood pressure and potentially improved immune function. And studies specifically in people with uh, chemo brain 
that has shown that regular mindfulness meditation improves the integrity of white matter and increases gray matter concentration. So those structural changes that we talked about earlier are something that actually respond to mindfulness meditation. Meditation can change your brain. It's a real thing. All right. Something related to the concept of mindfulness is mindful self-compassion. Most of us like to see ourselves as compassionate people, at least when it comes to our attitudes toward others. Sometimes, somehow, we are much harder on ourselves than we are or would be uh, when it comes to dealing with anyone else. Um, and that's a problem. You know, what is it that makes us so special that we should hold ourselves to a, a higher standard than we hold others to? There are three main components to mindful self-compassion. One is self-kindness versus self-judgment, which is really what it sounds like. Being, being kind to yourself when you are suffering or recognize that you have messed up or um, recognizing that you know, you, you've fallen short of your own goals in some way versus judging yourself hardly and being self-critical. This concept of common humanity versus isolation, recognition that suffering is actually part of the human experience. It's not something unique to us. Um, and while we may be struggling or in pain, um, this is an experience that other people could probably share or, or have knowledge of. Um, so not seeing it as something that is solely our own. And then mindfulness versus over-identification. That's finding an emotional balance when it comes to allowing yourself to feel what you feel and the negative emotions or the, the self-doubt or the pain, um, but not, not thinking that that's all you are or that how you feel in the moment is all that matters. I'm trying to find some balance in processing those emotions, but also recognizing that you're likely to feel better in a couple hours or a couple days, or even though you have these flaws and shortcomings, you also have some wonderful strengths. Okay, um, I'm going to try to cover this in the next three minutes. Um, in your list of references is a review of prescription medications that are sometimes prescribed to cancer survivors um, and have some implications for chemo brain or symptoms of cognitive dysfunction. Modafinil was a medication that was developed to treat um, narcolepsy and MS-related fatigue. It is sometimes prescribed for cancer survivors who are just exhausted. Um, and often those folks will report that they feel like they think better and remember better with use of that medication. That may be just because they're less fatigued. Methylphenidate is basically Ritalin. Um, it's associated with decreased fatigue and improved cognition. But the data are mixed and probably strongest in kids. Um, and I think there is some controversy among physicians in terms of whether they're comfortable prescribing this for chemo brain. Denepazil um, is a medication that was developed to treat Alzheimer's disease. There have been some studies that have found that it improves cognition in animal models um, and maybe in some adults and pediatric patients. Um, but again, I'm not sure how strong the data are. And then we've talked about hormones. Um, in some cases, there's potential that hormone replacement might improve cognition, but they're also associated risks, um, particularly for women. Um, caffeine is a legal performance enhancing drug. I am a great fan. Um, in reasonable quantities, it actually does improve attention and processing speed. There have also been some studies that suggest that consuming two to four cups of coffee a daily is, neuro, daily is neuroprotective, um, that in some cultures where that's a common practice, the risk of dementia is reduced. And then powdered American ginseng has been found to be associated with improved, perceived improvements in cognitive functioning um, in cancer survivors. There's a whole bunch of other stuff out there on um, nutritional, nutrition and supplements. I'm going to say one thing about supplements because there's been this huge proliferation of uh, privately produced um, supplements that claim to be brain boosters that, or you know, improve brain function in normal healthy people or improve recovery from brain injury. Um, if you are... If you're interested in things like that and you identify something that you are considering purchasing, I would encourage you to do two things. One is to look at the ingredients and try to do a search of the literature, of the medical literature, to see if there have been any clinical trials or any reputable studies that have demonstrated that that agent actually is useful or facilitates cognitive recovery or improves performance. 
The other is that there's a great website called consumerlabs.com that allows you to check whether the content of a supplement um, has, is you know, reliable and has been verified. So if something says it contains ginseng or red yeast rice, um, has the product been tested and what were the findings? Okay. So we are at 10 of. You have additional slides in there to talk a little bit about the relationship between nutrition and cognition in general. Um, this could be a whole separate talk. Um, but I did include a little information on something called the MIND diet, um, which is a not overly restrictive diet that has been found to reduce the risk for Alzheimer's disease. So if you're interested in that, you can check it out. And I think we should probably stop here and hope for some questions. Okay. All right. Thank you so much for that information. Just to, to provide an overview of the slides that are remaining, um, Dr. Thompson has provided you with some, some resources that she suggests. Um, I assume that would, that would be at, in addition to the information she's provided yeah. today. Um, and she's also provided you with some slides um, that um, provide references for the research um, that she spoke of today. Um, and just as a reminder, we do provide handouts um, for our presentations. Um, if you have not yet accessed that handout, please see the site coordinator. Um, if you're attending at a live lecture viewing site, um, and if you're attending online um, via GoToWebinar, that, that handout is available within the handout section. It's also made available on our website on the, the page for today's event. Um, as we move into the um, question and answer period um, of our lecture, we will be using Poll Everywhere. If you participate in our poll at the beginning of our lecture, um, you're already um, signed into Poll Everywhere. If you have not yet participated and would like to participate again, you will text the letters UNCCN to the number 22333. Um, and we'll post uh, the, the poll slide up and hopefully within the next few seconds we'll have some uh, questions that come in. Um, while we're waiting on that, Dr. Thompson, I have a question um, regarding screen time. Mm -hmm. um, you talked a little bit about yeah. screen. Screen time could be detrimental to, to sleep, um, if, especially if you um, have a lot of screen time right before you sleep. And then you also talked a little bit um, about tools that would require you to have screen time that, that could provide some benefit. Um, when you think about screen time in general, um, to some, to a patient who may be experiencing the effects of chemo brain, um, is there any research or any information that provides um, support or lack of support for screen time in general being a benefit or maybe a detriment? I, I don't know of any research specifically for cancer survivors or folks with chemo brain. There's actually been a lot of research on uh, screen time in folks with post-concussion syndrome. Okay. So one of the other things I do is see retired professional football players and, and student athletes who've had concussions who have persistent symptoms, cognitive symptoms, somatic symptoms, um, and part of the return to play and return to school guidelines have to do with minimizing screen time. There's something about um, being required to, to look at the screen and process that kind of information that appears to be somewhat stressful okay. for the brain, though again, if you're 12, it may be a different experience than if you're 60. Okay. Um, with respect to the you know, sleep, the thought is that the, lumi the, lumin the luminescence of the screen um, acts like other kinds of light, um, and your brain typically, when exposed to light, isn't thinking about sleeping. The natural cues to transition toward sleep in you know, our, our primitive environments were that it would get dark and then you would fall asleep. Um, so when you are exposing yourself to intense light right up until the moment you decide to try to go to bed, it probably delays the transition. Okay. Very good information. Okay. okay, we've had a couple questions come in. The first one is, uh, what is your opinion on the use of melatonin as a sleep aid? Works great for some people. Um, and sometimes you have to play with the dose. A, a lot of people like it because it's an, some substance that occurs in your body naturally anyway. Um, I think, though, that the, you have to try it to find out if it's going to be effective. That is one of the things we recommend to our patients with post-concussion syndrome who are having trouble sleeping. All right. Um, another question is, 
does Tai Chi count as body mind as a body mind skill? Absolutely. Um, and Tai Chi, actually, I'm working with somebody who's getting ready to do a study. Um, working with cancer survivors here at UNC where they're going to look at um, the effectiveness of Tai Chi as an intervention for chemo brain specifically. Um, tai Chi is a mind-body skill because it requires you to think about what you're doing with your body. Um, and to, in order to do it well, you have to maintain your focus and your attention on what you're doing. Um, and if you're somebody like me whose balance isn't naturally great anyway, it's, it's a great skill for developing both your physical and your cognitive functioning. Okay, and we have another one that's just come in. It says, you said that both chemo and treatment without chemo are associated with cognitive decline. Um, do you have a sense of whether one is worse than the other in terms of, um, and I guess we can assume um, as its effects on chemo brain, um, Okay, if you, if, you, if you submitted that question, feel free to submit another question with kind of a second part, um, both chemo and treatment. I, if, I, yeah. If you think you can speak to that? Or, I'll, I'll try. Okay. Um, I, you may not like the answer, though, because I think it's going to be it depends, um, in that it may depend on the kind of cancer. And, again, so cancer treatments are always attempting to – maximize the therapeutic effects in terms of you know, decreasing the presence of cancer cells and minimizing the impact on cognitive functioning. Um, I think if you, if you had you know, a kind of cancer that was equally as effectively treated with and without chemotherapy, you would probably elect for the, the treatment that did not involve chemotherapy because I think there's always the potential for chemotherapy to have additional adverse effects on your cognitive functioning. But it probably depends on the nature of the cancer and what the alternative treatments are. Um, next question, I think the next two are kind of together, says, um, will there be a new field of clinicians that focus specifically on cognitive rehabilitation? And you may... Well, I don't know that there's going to be a new field. It's definitely an area of interest that a lot of different disciplines are um, exploring in that there are neuropsychologists, which is what I am, who, who describe themselves as providing cognitive rehabilitation. Um, as I mentioned, there are occupational therapists and speech-language pathologists who do similar kind of work. There are physicians, neuropsychiatrists, who will say that they do cognitive rehabilitation. Part of the, the problem, though, is that there is currently no certification program or educational requirement that people have to complete in order to be able to say that they do that kind of work. Um, there are some guidelines. The, the, there's a physical medicine and rehabilitation society that has uh, published recommended guidelines for cognitive rehabilitation, but it's one of those things that almost anyone in any specialty could claim that they do, which makes it harder than to know whether you're getting good care or, or not. Um, so that may change over time, but at this point, it's, it's not an activity that belongs to any specific discipline. Okay. We have two other questions, and I think we can, because of their nature, we can address them before we go today. Do you know any uh, mm. current clinical trials open now to study chemo, chemo brain? I do not, but I bet you could recommend a website to check out. Um, yes, I think probably the best website for that, um, to pick, based on information from some of our past lectures, would be uh, clinicaltrials.gov, um, and you can do keyword searches there that um, prob probably using chemobrain um, that could probably help you identify some. Um, next question, what was the book that contained the fourth meeting concept, please? I'm not sure I understand what you're asking about. Okay. Um, well, let's see if we can address the other one and, okay. and maybe... We'll receive some more information around that question. Are there people in Chapel Hill who could support my 18-year-old son with chemo brain who survived Burkitt's lymphoma? Quite possibly. Um, it, and if Chapel Hill is close enough for you to, or for him to travel back and forth. Um, I realized that my presentation did not include my email address, okay. which I want to make available to folks who have any questions and want to follow up with. So it's okay. my first name, Carla underscore, last name Thompson, at med for med.unc.edu. So if the person who asked the question about um, your son, if you want to email me, 
Um, we can have a conversation about that, but I would think quite possibly yes. Okay, and I think we have a follow-up. The book that was being referenced was about forest uh, bathing. Okay, so the book <coughs> where I first read about forest bathing is the um, Sherry Kessler book, Improving Cognitive Functioning After Cancer. And we kind of flew through the slide, but in your handout, under Resources for Patients and Caregivers, um, there's a book called Improving Cognition, Cognitive Functioning After Cancer. But if you're interested in learning more about that concept, I would go to Google Scholar and put in forest bathing. Oh, and the book, the other book that includes a lot of information about um, the therapeutic effects of nature is called The Nature Fix. And I am blanking on the name of the author at this point. But if you look for The Nature Fix, oh, I think it's Florence Williams, um, you'll find that book. Okay, lots of great questions and definitely a topic that, that, that has lots of information that I'm sure people want to learn about. Before we leave today, we are a few minutes over, but we're, we're almost to the end of our session. Um, I'd like to say thank you to the state of North Carolina and the University Cancer Research Fund um, for their support of the UNC Cancer Network and this program, as well as the support of the UNC Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center um, and the members of the UNC Cancer Network telehealth team um, that make this possible today. Um, a reminder, our next lecture um, at the end of next month on July 28th um, is with um, Mary Dunn, um, and the title is Prostate Cancer, What to Expect Along the Journey. Um, I'm sure if prostate cancer is something that you're interested in, um, this, this will be a very informative talk. Ms. Dunn has done presentations um, for us in the past, and, and she's a very excellent and knowledgeable presenter. So. Um, if prostate cancer is any, of any interest to you or someone that, um, that, that you care about, um, this will be a very informative talk. Um, so with, with that, um, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Thompson for being here with us today um, for a very informative talk on not only what causes chemo brain, but more importantly um, about what we can do to deal with any effects that, that, that we may be experiencing as we go through treatment or we just age in general. So thank you very much for being with us thank today. Um, and thank you to all of you in our audience um, for participating. Um, hope you have a, a great rest of your Friday and a great weekend. See you next time. Bye-bye.